Welcome, I'm Mr Nelson. Hopefully some of you will remember me and welcome particularly to the OCs. We thought that it'd be nice to capture aspects of chapel, both from the exterior and then shortly the interior, particularly at a time when people can't visit perhaps as much as they would normally due to the dreaded COVID. So the chapel here is the chapel of St Mary and St George. This is, as many of you know, the second incarnation, the second chapel, the former being by somebody called Humphreys from 1858. And of course, we then moved into this chapel after the 50 years or the semi-centennial commemoration of college's founding. And it was 1891, the project began. And by 1896, it was by and large completed. But I thought we'd start with the exterior and with the large oak door at the west end, we have either side flanking it. On our left, the figure of Queen Victoria. She marks the beginning of the building project. And on our right of the door is Edward VII, and that marks the completion of the phase of building. And a little bit later, the cloister that we go to in a moment was added in 1919 and completed in 1921. But above the door, you'll see, of course, the college crest, the college shield with our motto, Labor Omnia Vincit, work conquers all. And also the shields there that refer to Harcourt and Iredell, who were the founders of the school in 1841. You may get some sense of the height of the building. It's a very lofty building. And in fact, the highest point is marked at the very top of the lantern which is at the top itself of the tower. And then at the very top, you have a cupola and a cross. And that is 122 feet up, just to give you some indication of scale. And the exterior, which is very lofty, tall, narrow, slim, it is loosely based on buildings like King's College, Cambridge, as well as Eton College Chapel. And that was in part stipulated in the brief when the competition had been launched after the 50 years of college's founding, so 1891. And the competition had in fact attracted people like Jackson, Blomfeld, even George Gilbert Scott, but it was ultimately Henry Prothero of Hazelwell. He won the competition, an OC thus, and he collaborated with the manager of his firm, who was John Middleton, and then Thomas Collins also from his firm were brought in to complete the interior schema, and that was completed itself in 1907. So just currently standing in the chapel quad, just to remind people that of course the original chapel, which is facing me now, of 1858 by Humphreys, this was in fact a north-south elevation and thus should in fact be facing east towards Jerusalem and towards the rising sun. And due to its scale, it was not actually appropriate for the growing college populace Furthermore, the proportions, it's very squat, very broad, but not particularly long. And the acoustics were subsequently poor too. So that was partly why, of course, we raised subscriptions for the 1891 reconception of the college chapel. And if we look over to the chapel now, you will hopefully be able to see some of the stop ends, which are the mouldings, the faces, and there are further round the other side, which are in fact stop ends for the history of the college really in terms of former headmasters but also prime ministers and figures from poetry from literature and also from the faith also and the tall aspect here you can see of the exterior has been broken with a kind of regular vertical rhythm of the buttresses which protrude out and therefore dividing that exterior space into a series of bays that's of course then echoed internally where we have the lunettes which are the paintings above each of the bays where in fact each house would stand. So we're now in the cloister, albeit only a small part of a cloister. Traditionally, a cloister in a medieval building, possibly an abbey, would have been a quad, quadrangle, and of course grass in the centre. So it's really an arcaded walkway, and it's where the choir assemble and then process into the first part of the building, which is called the narthex, which precedes the main nave of the chapel. But what's beautiful about this is, of course, the fan vaulting. And the project of the cloister was rather later than the chapel itself. 
So it commenced in 1919 and was finished in 1921. With the beautiful fan vaulting, which is itself hollow, it echoes the fan vaulting of the first example in England, which was actually at Gloucester Cathedral. So it kind of pays homage or doffs a cap to its ancestor not too far away. And rather beautifully, in terms of a pattern, that was the first example of fan vaulting in England, as I say, and this was in fact the last. So there's a neat pattern there. A beautifully carved, a lot of the building is about hand craftsmanship, hand labor, and restoring that interest and joy in labor, as John Ruskin would have put it, in a time of, of course, the industrial age. So it was anti the machine aesthetic. And little features over here and either side of me, in fact, represent the bullflowers. And each of these bullflowers was carved by hand. Again, it's a reference to Gloucester. And in each window at Gloucester Cathedral, there are in fact 1,300 of these hand-carved bullflowers. We don't quite have the same number, but still equally an impressive array of biophilia. And just down here, there's a reference to, and a slightly erroneous figure now, of six 175 OCs who died in the First World War because after further research recently during the commemorations, the hundred years, the centenary, it's been discovered there are in fact 702 who passed in the war from college. So there's also below it an inscription and an excerpt taken from Virgil's Aeneid about giving oneself up for your homeland, your fatherland. And it's just worth looking up as you enter into this cloister, because as well as the ball flowers and the wonderful fan vaulting, you also have the very ornate centerpieces and the therefore boss work, as it's called, of the sculpted flower and the rose in the center there. A lot of the flowers will actually be symbolic as well. You have, for example, the vine for the Eucharist, which obviously has resonance as a religious building. So we've actually proceeded into the interior space now, got out of the slight cold climbs at the moment, and we're now in an area called the narthex. And narthex really precedes the chapel. It's a little bit like an anti-chapel, A-N-T-E chapel, but the narthex is invariably either an interior space or an exterior space. So you either have an exo-narthex or an eso-narthex. This is the eso because it's covered. And above us, we've got some rather beautiful carving. Again, the fan vaulting, the rose motif in the centerpiece. And that, of course, represents our college crest or shield. Again, our stemmer, if you will, a kind of shield. And much of the work here is by a firm called Boltons & Co. And some of the fan vaulting was provided by a figurehead called Barnard. So these were the kind of masters of the arts and crafts movement, hand sculptors, hand craftsmen, in particular, the stonework is really, really impressive. It shows us, obviously, the references to some of the collegiate examples that it's based on in places like Magdalen College, Oxford, King's College, Cambridge, where there is indeed a prevalence of stonework during particularly the perpendicular Gothic phase, and in our case, obviously, a revival. So just behind me, you should be able to see the windows that represent actually how we were founded as one of the schools of the Masonic Lodges. And so there were 10 of these private schools of Freemasonry in terms of their founding. And that would include behind me as well, Charterhouse, Clifton, and obviously ourselves second down on the left there. And then just before we enter the main body of the chapel, we're going to have a very brief look at a wonderful glass mosaic. So just above me, you should be able to see a really colorful and thus polychromatic Venetian glass mosaic. And this was executed by J.E.D. Reed. J.E.D. Reed was the head of art at Cheltenham Ladies College. And it represents King Solomon presenting the temple to God and thus allegorically and metaphorically, it's seen as Henry Prothero giving the chapel to college in 1896, effectively. So we're now in the main nave of the chapel itself, or indeed the central aisle. Invariably a religious building, we enter from the west and we approach the east end and thus to my left, north and south as the aspect. Normally, of course, it would be cruciform in structure if a larger building 
and therefore normally we'd have a North Isle and a South Isle. In our case, there are obviously pews here, and each of these in a bay is effectively a given house. And rather unlike the Oxford movement, Tractarianism and the Ecclesiologist movement, the actual pews face inwards rather than towards the pulpit or towards the altar. And it was considered that if the Houses of Parliament were to be evacuated during the Blitz, they were actually going to use our chapel as a relocation for the House of Lords or the House of Commons, which would have been rather interesting, such is the arrangement of the pews. But the first point to make about the nave is that the word itself comes from navis, which is a ship in Latin. And therefore, it refers to the idea of our building being like a sanctuary, a ship, a port in a storm, metaphorically. And the other word for the ship we use is bark, with a Q-U-E at the end. And part of this links to it being a sanctuary, to it being a refuge, but also because many of these buildings in the medieval period, early medievalism, would have actually been made, in case of the roof, of wood. And they'd have been constructed, in fact, by boat builders. And in a moment, we're going to look somewhat heavenwards to the roof space and the ribbed vaulting. And it does, in fact, represent the keel of a boat. And in some cases, Scandinavia particularly, there is often a boat or a ship hanging in the nave for that symbolism that I've alluded to. So the interior space here would have been completed in 1907, even though the building itself was actually consecrated in 1896. Slightly ominous beginnings, rather portentous beginnings, because initially the gentleman who was assigned to open and consecrate the chapel, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury, died the night before he was set to come and do this. And so instead, the Archbishop of Dublin, a figure called Lord Plunkett, came and opened the building. And that same night, there was an earthquake in Herefordshire, very unusually, and the tremors of this were felt in the fabric of our building. And in fact, in each bay's case, the side walls have been separated from the roof space, creating this crack at the top of every one of the pointed arched windows. Although in 1896 we feel very safe now, of course, after such a long time has elapsed, that we are fundamentally very, very safe. And in fact then, Lord Plunkett himself died only four months later, having opened the building. So it was almost a little bit of a poison chalice initially, although of course we've enjoyed such a rich history ever since. And initially I gather the Rugby posts were stored in the crypt. We also had a colony of pipistral bats. So it's enjoyed a very rich history, as I say, ever since. If we turn now, just briefly, to look at the various lunettes. So each of these lunettes, which is the sort of semicircular, although pointed, these are half-arched paintings. They are executed by J. E. D. Reed, aforementioned and this was the head of art at CLC. And if we think about the symbolism, the iconography involved here in theological terms, on our north side, we have the Old Testament, and on the south side, we have the New Testament. And numerically, there are six on either side. And if we add that to the other side, of course, we end up with 12 to represent the 12 apostles. So numerology resounds throughout the building. Invariably, we have the number three. For example, there are three steps up to the altar for the Trinity. We have four stone steps prior to that, which represent the four evangelists. And occasionally as well in a religious building like this, we have five to represent the wounds of Christ. So with regards to the east end of the chapel, we invariably face this beautiful east window, and that allows the light, particularly in the morning, to flood in because it faces the rising sun. And that window is 26 feet across. And it was given by Baron and Baroness de Ferrière, who are of Wilson acclaim. They established our museum, our main art gallery museum in Cheltenham. Few of the other windows, in fact, the stained glass windows were completed. They were to represent the Beatitudes. And so many of the aspects of the chapel in terms of iconography symbolism, it does in fact link to the virtues. 
but not a huge number were completed by its realisation in 1896. But facing that east end there, we also see the Reredos, and the Reredos is the stone screen. And this is very much, and very particularly based on, Magdalen College in Oxford. And it's divided up into three parts for the Trinity, so it's a tripartite organisation, in a sense quasi-triptych, therefore, in orientation. And the figures on the stone screen, which is in, incidentally clunch stone from Cambridgeshire, are those of the church, people like Newman and Pusey from the Oxford movement, but also they are representative of poets, there's Shakespeare as well, and other figures from literature, and the history of the college invariably too. Much of the chapel is, of course, a monument, a posthumous monument, to those that gave their lives in various wars, including the Boer War, as well as World War I, World War II, and South Africa at the turn of the century also. Great deal of wood prevails, and the wood carving itself is particularly rich, particularly impressive. Most of it was supplied by a firm called Martin & Co, with a YN. I mention it particularly because if one was to just continue on from Leckenfield and cut across that London road, just at the intersection there, there is a plaque where Martin and Co were based, the firm that did much of the work, overseen by Thomas Collins. Much of the Gothic style, the intention is to draw our eyes heavenwards. And in fact, if we think about the arch itself of a window, of a door in the Gothic style, it's meant to represent the praying hands or the sign of perhaps benediction. And all of the lines lead us heavenwards, including the cluster columns behind me here. These are slender colonnettes that are gathered together to create one half pier, effectively. But all of those lines soar heavenwards, above the windows, to that roof space. And if we think about the dimensions, this is 55 feet high. And to put that into perspective, it's about four foot lower than Tewkesbury Abbey, which is, of course, a major medieval monument. So ours being a school chapel, really impressive in its scale. The length of the building, coincidentally, from the exterior perspective, so outside, is 164 feet long, and the width of the chapel is 34 feet across. But if we turn our attentions towards that roof space, we have the ribbed vaulting. And the system used is called the quadripartite vaulting system. And it's a union jack configuration, purportedly, where the ribs are divided up into that configuration. And they meet in the centre at a boss. And there are eight of these circular boss formations, which are sculpted and moulded in stone. And they work chronologically from the west end, and in fact beyond the organ, all the way down to our east end. Eight of those representing, chronicling the life of Christ from the Annunciation, terminating in the last judgment in that east end. We might also notice as well those cracks in the wall joins where the side wall of the bay each time meets with that roof space. And there is one longitudinal ridge that works all the way down the central apex of the building. So in effect, it's almost like a human body. It's corporeal. And often, in fact, a religious building is meant to be representative of Christ lying on the cross, which is why invariably this east end collectively is called the chevet, which means pillow or cushion in French, where his head would lie. So I've referred already to the woodwork in here, the sculpted rich woodwork, which is handcrafted, and that great joy and labour of Ruskin, Pugin, Morris, that they propagated during the arts and crafts movement of which the hub was essentially in the Cotswolds. And it reaches a zenith or an apogee in our beautiful South Door sculpted monument to a figure called Myers. And Myers here is seen in bas relief, in profile. His friends collaborated, clubbed together to raise subscriptions and funds to provide this beautiful monument to him who enjoyed a very rich history here at college and indeed beyond an illustrious career. But the sculpted carving, which is incredibly meticulous, intricate, biomorphic design, is by a lad called Harry Dean. And Harry Dean was the sort of darling of Martin and Co. 
and I think was purportedly the kind of Grinling Gibbons of his day, apropos of the sculptural carving in wood. And it represents the tree of life, but as well, allegorically, it represents the triumph of life over death. And it's created by virtue of sycamore wood, and it represents in part as well a wild rose that grew in Myers's garden in Keswick. So we're just closing in to the beautiful hand carving and craftsmanship of this Myers Memorial and the south door. And we can see some of the flora and fauna here. There's a little reed warbler's nest you might notice here and the various bulrushes that grow and emanate from here. They in part allude to our further and broader estate with, for example, Lake House Lodge and the Prep, all of which was owned, belonged to Lord Northwick, who we really bought the estate from effectively. But there's a little bit of esoteric symbolism down here. There's a mole and just emerging from the earth there. But according to Henry Dean, who created this, he said that Myers' first encounter with death as a young child was to find a dead mole. And so there's a kind of private reference to that in terms of the patron, if you like, of this monument. Moving up towards some of the birds here, the avifauna, therefore, we have reed warblers, and there is their nest, of course, busying themselves around. And it's about that kind of fecundity and fervour in nature, the idea of industry and God's industry, if you like, in terms of spreading that word, because we often have Christ in ministry, Christ the Good Shepherd on our west door, and therefore, broadly, it's about the growth of the church and the spread of the religious message. And over on this side here, we have some beautiful avifauna again. There is, in fact, a swallow, a type of hirundine, and the swallow is synonymous with journeying, with traveling, because, of course, it migrates to Africa and returns to England in the spring. So it's invariably seen as a messenger and is often associated with the Annunciation, but also the spreading of the Christian message. We have a kingfisher here and a dragonfly, and both of those are now built into the fabric of college. We have College Lawn, the boarding house that's been fairly recently built, and their symbol is the dragonfly on account of its reference here and more broadly at college. And also the kingfishers, of course, part of the prep makeup of the younger children who start here with us. Above, you've got this beautiful growth of that rose that flows and is in a sequential motion above the oak door. And with that briar rose, we also have further birds, and in fact, a reference to the crossbill. And the crossbill is the only bird that has two opposing mandibles. In other words, its beak jaw goes in different directions. And therefore, it was a very useful tool, a kind of plier that pulled out purportedly the nails from the cross of Christ. The blood of the martyr then stained the breast, which is why they have a red breast. And that was therefore symbolically a reference to God the Father and Christ his Son. So behind me, of course, the wonderful organ, not in fact the original organ. The original organ was provided by a firm called Norman and Beard of Norwich. It was then replaced after about 40 years by a wonderful Harrison and Harrison organ of Durham. And fairly recently, it underwent a massive MOT and every single bit was dismantled, cleaned, taken away to a workshop up in, I believe, Newcastle and cleaned and restored beautifully and it's been returned to its former splendour. We also have the addition of a 32-foot reed, which gives us this incredible bass note. And of course, with Mr Finch on the organ there, amazing sound that resonates through our chapel and really bolsters us up, shores us up when we sing in particular our hymns that we've become fairly famous for. But because Prothero, who designed and built the chapel with Middleton and Collins, was himself a very accomplished musician, an organist, he designed, in fact, the organ casement, so that outer core, which is rather rich and beautiful in terms of its organic decoration. And then above the organ and the various, of course, pipes, we have at the very top, the apex of the whole design, a figure of St. Cecilia. And St. Cecilia is the patron saint of music. 
and she is accordingly flanked by two fanfaring or trumpeting angels to pass on that message of the joy of music that we celebrate every day in chapel. So we now find ourselves in the far east end and of course on the high altar on the steps. And just behind me I wanted to point out this rather beautiful sequence which is the adoration of the Magi, the visitation of the three wise men, Melchior, Balthazar and Caspar who came from the east bearing gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh to give to the infant Christ child. And it's done in a rather wonderful sequence of relief. If we think about the parts of a choir, the higher voice is an alto, we have a middle voice, mezzo, and then the low voice, basso. And in Italian, in relief, it's called rilievo. And here with the high raised relief, we have alto rilievo, where the kings and the knees, for example, of the Virgin protrude right out towards us in high relief. We then have our mezzo rilievo, where the older king looks in, and then behind we have the company of angels in lower or shallow relief, which is our basso rilievo. And all of that is executed in this rather beautiful clunch stone from Cambridgeshire. But one of the aspects of the chapel is that, in fact, the stonework is rather grey, rather colourless, if you will, in a quite a beautiful way, because at this time in the Gothic Revival, we'd got very used to what became known as polychromania. In other words, an obsession with covering everything, with glittering colour, richness, particularly reds and golds. And therefore, this was a kind of later relief at the end of the Gothic Revival in a period called the Perpendicular, which came after the very decorated central High Gothic. And some see our building that's light, lofty, airy, and rather colourless as a kind of sobering, palette cleanser after the somewhat rich, decadent, high gothic of the 19th century. So we're of course now up in the gallery and given college's capacity currently at over 700, we now have pretty much a house each time we worship in here occupying this gallery space and of course therefore abutting the organ and that wonderful encasement I referred to earlier by Prothero just beyond me here. And in this gallery space here, we can see the full expanse of the chapel. We get a sense of its lofty proportions, its height at 55 feet, that length that I mentioned at 164. It really is quite an expansive building for a college chapel. And indeed, I hope that Cheltonians have very fond memories of coming here, of visiting as well on your return to college. And invariably, you are so welcome to come back. We have even songs which will be published and advertised, of course, in various brochures on the website. And further to that, we have the carols that I'm sure you've enjoyed online this year and the various services that will ensue into the new year. So do please come back and visit us. It's the most special space that we have at college, the only place that we can all fit, of course, now. And I hope that it holds fond memories for you. So come back and see us. And if you'd like to know any more about the chapel, there's the great book by Nicholas Lowton, former housemaster of Hazelwell and assistant chaplain. And I've produced a kind of slimmed down booklet as well, which is available both as a PDF and as a hard copy, should anybody request it, from the Cheltonian Society. So thank you very much for listening. I hope it's been interesting and enriching and perhaps brings back some rather fond memories of your time at college. And we hope that you'll return and see us again and enjoy this beautiful space, this ecclesiastical space that is really awe-inspiring and impressive and never ceases to wow prospective parents and visitors to the great school that is Cheltenham College. So thank you very much.